the legacy and our education speakers about a decade ago. I uh, took a position at Millersville University and one of the first guests I brought to my class was Clyde McGeary. And as he started talking to my students, I realized um, that I had a lot to learn about the history of art education in Pennsylvania, but also was compelled um, to document the things he was saying um, because it occurred to me that I wasn't the only one who didn't know the history and the value of what he shared was so great. So at that point, I was um, in a role at PAEA that we call the conference consultant. And so the following, maybe like two years later, um, we designed a legacy in art education speaker series that typically is a breakfast that we hold at the conference. And so this is almost 12 hours later than we've ever held a legacy in art education <laughs> speaker. Um, so feel free to have breakfast for dinner if you'd like as we <clears throat> as we listen. But uh, the first uh, legacy in art education speaker happened in Harrisburg in 2015. And we've had a speaker every year since. The people that we've honored so far are Clyde McGeary, Lynn Horashak, Sarah Tambucci, Mary Lou Dallum, Mary Ann Stankwitz. And this year we have uh, the honor of hearing from Kelly Armour. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that we, are, uh, we have documented all of these talks. And it's pretty amazing to know that the history of our field is being recorded through stories folks have told. Um, and so uh, on PAEA's YouTube channel, we are working on um, having the legacy in our education series be its own, you know, you could search specifically for just those because there's a lot of media up on PAEA's YouTube channel at this point. Um, so I hope you enjoy this. We, this Kelly is our 2020 legacy in art education speaker. And this is the last formal event of the 2020 online conference. And so when we return, fingers crossed to a face-to-face -face conference in the fall, um, the conference team and um, Dana Ativo, the conference consultant have already nominated um, the next legacy in art education speaker. So you could look forward to hearing from another one of our legacies in the fall at the conference. All right, Mary Elizabeth is going to introduce us to this year's um, Legacy in Art Education speaker. Yes, thank you, Leslie Gates. It was my pleasure to co-nominate with Jess Alesso, Kelly Armour for this honor to look to the, we looked to the Erie region and we said to ourselves, who has made an, a really strong impact over a period of many years to arts education in the Erie region and in, in the region to the Northwestern Pennsylvania region. And uh, Kelly has been named Outstanding Art Museum Educator of the Year. And she has received a Prophet of Peace Award from the Benedictine Sisters of Erie and a 2013 Imagine Award for her service to art education through Erie Arts and Culture. So she's she's received many honors, but this, um, this honor is really special to me to to um, nominate Kelly for because of her influence on so many art educators in the region and so many people who have come together for projects such as Kids as Curators and the Old Songs New Opportunities projects where many art teachers and music teachers have learned of, of beautiful things happening in our community that they were not active with before and especially with diversity and community engagement. And I first got to know Kelly and I think about 2005 when Chris Fontes uh, and I met with Kelly, I think at maybe a, a coffee shop on State Street to plan for kids as curators. And soon we asked Kelly to join the board of the PA Art Education Association. And we got in, I, I think her car with the cow print seat covers and drove to Harrisburg. And there's nothing like um, being in a long car ride uh, to really get to know someone. and. And of course, our co collaborations have just continued over the years with many projects. Most recently, we were, we and several of us here were on Cherry Street and Brown Avenue painting a new mural um, with a community collaborator. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Armour as a 2020 legacy speaker in art education. Well, thank you. It's such an honor. It's such an honor. Uh, and uh, I, and this is going to be not terribly, not oppressively formal. 
since we all fit in the same Zoom screen, which is pretty wonderful. Um, and as long as you feel comfortable, it's really great to see your faces. Um, a, a folklorist friend of mine actually did a, a webinar this past week, and she she, she was she was explaining what is folklore, and the first thing that she she put on her screen was a Zoom sc screenshot. And she said, you know culture, it's everywhere and different people and different groups of different cultures. And I want, and this might be an odd way to talk about culture, but I tell you my eight-year-old son went wandering over while I was in a, a Zoom talk video conference and he was like, everybody's got their cameras on. That's so strange, none of mine do. And there you go, there's a bit of a cultural difference. So. Thank you for for leaving your 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 videos on if if you're if you're comfortable with that. I also understand things get get wonky with the uh, with um, uh, strong connections and other things going on in your life and in the background. So I understand if you if you can't do that. So uh, so I'm, I'm gonna what what I'd like to do is we're gonna I'm gonna start with just a, a very 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 quick little my life. Um, where, where I came from, how I ended up, where I am now. Um, and then uh, I wanted to do a little interactive thing to talk about different kinds of culture. And, uh, and then we'll get to, um, and then I'll talk a little bit more in depth, maybe if it seems appropriate about some of the work uh, that I did with um, in the community and with kids as curators and art museum education. Oops, no. Where we're gonna start actually is not with me, but with an image. We're gonna start with a little VTS. So. And here we go. This is a painting. And well, what's going on in this, uh, what's going on in this painting? A community happening. A community happening. So what do you see that makes you say it's a community happening? Well, a whole bunch of people, uh, I guess, looking at this quickly, it looks like there's three different, four different groups of people, blue, red, black, gray, um, but they're all intermingling and they're all interacting and appears to be everybody is rather happy. All right, so you're noticing their, their facial expressions look for the most part happy. You're noticing that there's in um, there's four, four different colors, uh, the blue, red, black, blue, red, black. There's one gray on the bottom left. Oh, oh and there's a gray, yes, there we go, yep. And there's a one gray person down here uh, and that they all seem to be, I said, did you say they were, celebrating what do you see that makes you say that they're celebrating i said they were interacting but it does look oh, okay. like they're, they're celebrating there's potential drink or food in the containers uh -huh. um, dance probably there's male and female uh-huh all right looks like so maybe cooking. Some, that looks like looks they're like cooking they're okay cooking. so you see some cooking implements uh-huh yeah. what, what more can you find Compositions really dynamic and give the uh, celebratory feel to yeah. it. You're getting a celebratory feel. So do you do you know uh, what what do you see that makes you say that it's celebratory? I think it was more of a feeling and the colors mm -hmm. more than what I was seeing individually. It was just the image at first glance and noticing the movement and the smiles and the color. Mm -hmm. So you're noticing movement, smiles, but you're getting a kind of overall gestalt of there's some sort of a celebration. Okay. What more can you find? From the chat, we see that everyone is touching in some way. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to toggle the chat. So I'm going to, who, whoever's did that, your back. <laughs> the chat, right. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so everybody is linked in some way to another person there. There's, there it looks like there's physical contact with everybody. All right. 
They are a nondescript location. There is a bit of a background with the blue and the yellow and the white and the greenish gray, but not anywhere in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're not getting any, there's no landscape um, tropes there, in other words, okay. There's a lot of echoing shapes around the figures. Oh, I had a hard time hearing that. There's a lot of echoing shapes around the figures. Ah, echoing shapes. Um, can you uh, tell us, what, let's look at one of them in particular. Do you have one that you um, can? If you look at the armpit of the red figure towards the top, and there's these sort of crescent shapes mm -hmm. repeated underneath the armpit. So you're so you're seeing and what hey what what did you call those crescent oh the crescent shapes yes and but initially you had a really echoing lovely, like an echo oh echoing shapes okay so you have these crescents up here and then you're noticing other um, these sort of squiggly lines down below so yeah there's repetitive patterns mm -hmm. uh, and repetitive shapes mixed in and the and the patterning is um more random mm -hmm. so yeah so the patterning is random. so there isn't you you really aren't sure you can't you don't see this regular you don't know what quite to expect if you look on one one zone of it it's not really going to let you know what the next zone is like and it creates a lot of energy Yes, lots and lots of energy. Okay. There the are use some of space. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary Elizabeth. I was just going to say the use of space is a little bit like a puzzle where where the negative space is used actively. That the negative space is engaged with those patterns. So there's a lot of density of pattern. Mm -hmm. Very yes, very dense, very busy. You might say. Um, and the negative space is uh, is very plays in a very active role. Angela in the chat says the movement in this piece reminds me of Keith Haring. Huh. Okay. So yeah, it has a, it so it bears a resemblance to Keith Haring's kind of vibrant movement. I see in the shapes that. Bar, uh, excuse me, that Jen was referencing, um, there is some reference to uh, that sort of tribal culture in a way. These, the shapes that are just to the right um, of the ones we were talking about, the crescents, they almost look like a coffee bean, but also um, mm -hmm. they remind me of a shell, like a, I don't know what they're called, but they look like little teeth, those yeah. shells that uh, clamp tower, together yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so you're noticing things that, that sort of echo um, tropical or, um, uh, or uh, Africa, um, cowries are associated with Africa as is, as is some, some coffee, although coffee is grown in lots of other places too. But I, said, I think you said tribal, um, tribal motifs. Yes. Yeah. Many of the cloth wraps that they're wearing are patterned, but not all of them. Ah, yeah. So you have some plain wraps, but some of them have the patterns. I feel like that one figure I keep getting drawn back to in the center, it's obviously female. It's a woman with multiple breasts. And I feel like maybe she is the center of whatever this tribal ritual is. I feel like everybody else is sort of dancing around her in a, almost like in a circle. Uh-huh, so for you, she's kind of a focal point and, yes. and that, and everything seems to be going around her. Um, mm -hmm. And she seems of some sort of, uh, seems some, somehow important or central to whatever this, whatever is happening is happening. It, it feels African also, and those, those beans that um, Jess was just talking about, 
um, they're like in the lower left hand corner and the lower right hand corner. And isn't um, caffeine, wasn't that used in Africa as a, a, a sort of trade or as a kind of money at one point in some African tribes? I'm not sure if coffee was, um, but it, it did, but cowrie shells, the cowrie shells have been used as currency in, okay. um, around the world, but particularly in, in Africa. Leslie uh -huh. in the chat points out that the woman appears to be the only woman in the entire picture. Yeah. She is definitely, definitely female. The others, it's not, it's a little ambiguous, but uh, she does, she does, she does have four breasts. Anything else? The is image is presented in halves. And I do not know if it's presented as a diptych or in a book or why there's a line down the middle. Mm -hmm. And if that was part of the reproduction or intended by the artist. And I also see a signature uh -huh. about two thirds of the way over on the bottom in a blue form mm -hmm. that kind of mirrors the breasts, but it's yeah, upside yeah, yeah. down. Yeah, there it is. It's right there. Mm -hmm. It's actually right side up. Um, and just for the interests of time, we're gonna, I, unless anybody has any burning comments to make, um, this, uh, this is by a Tanzanian, uh, so Africa is correct, um, a Tanzanian painter, he, is, he passed away um, not too terribly long ago, but his name is George Lalanga. And the title of this is in Swahili, but actually translates to uh, children, uh, playing in, on the children, um, dancing on the, or playing, it's the same word in Swahili, uh, on the uh, playing fields, uh, on different playing fields. That's the, that's it, which is interesting. Um, and he is a, uh, he is of a group in Tanzania, an ethnic group called the Makande people that were sort of revered for these sculptures, this folk art sculpture that they make where, and you can sort of, I don't know if you can see here, um, but there is a real resemblance. I mean, he has really taken it, to, he's a painter, but he's taken that same kind of aesthetic um, of everybody on top of one another. And that, that kind of sense of everybody touching uh, and the, the sense of it being a little crazy and and this kind of um, this kind of happy frenzy is very often seen in these Makande carvings, traditional carvings. So, so um, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, my dad used to say <laughs> that we were that he was a very high paid migrant laborer. He worked for General Electric. So he was a he was an engineer and I was I was born actually in Syracuse, New York. And then as a toddler, we moved outside of Boston. And then we moved to Erie when at the tail end of first grade. And we moved to Lawrence Park, which of those that know Erie is a small community just east of the city. And um, and I was the new girl until fifth grade when another new girl came in. <laughs> So I had this, very, this, 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 and it was a bit of a culture shock coming to Lawrence Park. I might have felt very differently if we had moved to Fairview or even in the city. But um, it was, uh, I was surrounded by Catholics, um, all these kids. And it was, and it was pretty amazing to me. I didn't really know any Catholics till I came to Erie. And it was that the spring of my first of first grade and then going into second grade, everybody had first was doing their first communion. I had no idea what it was, but I felt that I was getting cheated because they all got stuff, right? And I remember going to my teacher and asking her, because I didn't figure I didn't figure my parents would know what it was. Um, so I asked my teacher what it was and she blanched this woman who never blanched. She was like salt of the earth. Uh, it was one of her last years before she retired, Mrs. 
Mrs. Rhodes, uh, she blanched and told me I had to ask my parents. Um, and that was my first foray into realizing that not all questions are uh, acceptable. Um, but I, uh, I ended up, um, I ended up going, um, well, I ended up being, I was music. Oh, no, I did want to mention that my very first thing that I, my very first career choice was to be an art teacher. Um, and the, aside from wanting to be a ballerina when I was four, right? Um, or a princess, maybe when I was three. So, but this was, this was like the first informed this, oh, I could do this because I had an art teacher that I loved and that was Mrs. Mrs. Coral, um, who is a long time PA and now her daughter and her husband are all art teachers. But uh, it was this magical, this magical place that she had her art room um, and where we tried all sorts of different things. Um, and I also loved music and that was really my passion as a youth. And when I wanted to go to college, um, the idea of going to a musical conservatory held absolutely no interest, none at all, because I loved the world and I was curious about everything. And going to a conservatory would mean that I would just really focus on the craft of playing the flute. That was my main instrument. And so I wanted everything, music to sort of tie everything together. So uh, I wanted to go to a great school with a great music program. So. I ended up getting accepted to Yale University and I, and I thought it was going to be Nirvana. Um, I was disabused of that notion within weeks. Uh, it was nothing what I expected it to be. Um, now, I also credit that my high school education was pretty rigorous. Um, I uh, spent two years at a boarding school in Massachusetts before I went to Yale. And it was um, really, really rigorous education. And it was about thinking and creating your, making up your mind and, um, and weighing the alternatives. And when I got to Yale, I discovered that that wasn't really as important as being able to drop names. Um, I also was astounded at the sexism there. Um, and I now realize also in retrospect that the, the, the racism there, the, the basic, the elitism there was um, pretty oppressive. Um, it began to occur to me that the reason people wanted to go to places like Yale is because they could make those connections with the upper echelons of society uh, and be able to um, build upon those relationships. Uh, but it was very clear that somebody from suburban Erie, Pennsylvania had no power there at all. Um, and I remember trying to pipe in with my thoughts at certain seminars. And I remember the teaching assistants or the professor saying, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to have an opinion until you're published. You're supposed to quote what you've read. And there was also this kind of academic machismo that was in operation where you're supposed to be taking um, five courses a semester. Each course assigned a book to read every week. So, and these were not, you know, 100 page books. These were sometimes 500 page books. And there was this expectation that you were going to read five books in a week and be able to absorb that material. Of course, nobody did. Um, you learned to skim and you learned to be kind of um, good at quoting the major points, but there was no time really for reflection. It wasn't, that wasn't what it was about. Um, so I fell into, uh, I fell into an African uh, drumming seminar, which really, really changed my life. Um, because at the same time, I was also very frustrated with the music program. The music program is a very famous music theory department, um, and which is all about studying classical music between 1750 and 1950, preferably of 
Germanic composers. And it's about doing the, doing the, the numbers. It's, it's basically all about harmony uh, and, the, and it's how the numbers of the chords work their way out. And I was astounded. I remember asking my theory teacher, why, why don't, when are we gonna talk about emotion? When are we gonna talk about um, feelings? When are we gonna talk about um, uh, 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 aesthetic? When are we gonna, and he's like, no, this is the foundation of music. I said, and when are we gonna talk about other music? No, 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 this is the foundation of music. This is where we're gonna start. And if you wanna, if you want to drop out of this course, you may. Again, the question was not a good one. I would. I never in my life was a notorious person. I was always the good, good student. And all of a sudden I got this reputation for being a bit on, on the edge, on being a rabble rouser. And it, 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 blew, it blew my mind. Um, so I took this African drumming seminar that was, was being taught by a guest, uh, a, a, a guest uh, mu musician, and it was exactly what I was looking for. It was about basically studying culture. It was studying how music and culture intersect. And I fell in love with it, not, not just the music, which that was an important part of it, but the, the process, the process of exploring and being open and thinking about all those big questions. Um, so uh, I decided to leave the Ivy Tower, Ivory Tower um, and to go to Africa. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was also volunteering at a battered woman's shelter uh, when I was in living in New Haven, going to Yale. And when I finally decided, no, I'm really actually going to leave Yale. I'm going to find a school that will let me go to Africa and, and study African music and get and finish my uh, college career that way. Um, I would, I would tell that to other Yale students and they would, so many of them would say, oh, wow, that's amazing. You, oh, you're so lucky you can leave here. I wish I could go too, but I am nothing without a Yale degree. I am nothing. What would I, could, what would I possibly do? I couldn't ever get a job. I couldn't ever support myself. I have to be here. And the kinds of language that they were using was frighteningly similar to the language that battered women used to uh, rationalize why they were going back to their abuser because they were nothing without this power. They didn't feel strong enough unless they had this, um, this support, um, which is actually the same thing that's actually treating them terribly. Um, and that was a sobering thing. Um, now, there's lots of people that get a great education at Yale and it was formative in a very positive way. And I also had great experiences there with some professors who were truly remarkable. However, it was, uh, it was very clear to me that it was, a, this is how, um, <laughs> this is how the powerful stay in power. Um, it is not by listening to different voices. It is not by, um, it, it is not by questioning authority. It's by perpetrating it. So, um, so I found the school that enabled me to go to East Africa and to live with people and document it and then give me college credit. Um, it's the, it's Long Island University. At the time it was the friend, friends called Friends World College. Um, and that indeed was life-changing. Um, to be able to live with families and to learn music and to watch traditional life um, unfold around me all the time. Um, it was, uh, it, another thing is that my, my being headstrong and independent and willing to uh, question authority got me to Africa. But then once I got there, I had to take that entire skill set and put it, package it up and put it on a shelf because I discovered when I was living with an African family, uh, I had to respect authority and, uh, and, to, 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 and I had to follow the rules of a culture that was vastly different from the, uh, the one that I grew up in. Um, 
but I won, I was so hungry to learn. Um, and believe me, I also made lots and lots of big mistakes and, and uh, hurt and angered people, not um, just due to cultural differences and me not understanding. But it was, uh, it was amazing to see firsthand a culture that was truly built around a community and not an individual. And it was truly amazing to see how art fit in in a way, uh, living with people as a musician, living with people who were some the most musical people I had ever met who had absolutely no concept of what a performance was because music was tied to everything they did. It was never something that was placed outside of community life. Um, and it, it changed how I thought about everything. Um, so when I came back to the United States uh, and was trying to find a job, uh, it, it sort of made sense that I, I ended up trying to figure out where, where did I, where would I fit? What do I have to offer? And in Erie, um, and it, and there was a, there is a, a wonderful man who worked at Stairways, the clinical director at the time, he met me and he's like, you should work for us. And, uh, and I found myself working in, um, what eventually became Bloom Collaborative for those of you who are familiar with, with Stairways, um, and it was in an arts program. So I found myself, whereas I, in Africa, my job was just kind of try to figure out how arts and culture intersected. Uh, I found myself in Erie working with adults with mental illness and trying to figure out how arts could unlock their own potential and give them um, a chance of feeling more vibrant, more alive, more plugged into the community. So, uh, and as I then after, uh, then I spent 10 years as a itinerant uh, musician. Um, I uh, married a young man who is a songwriter and his father is an old uh, traditional fiddler. And we started a duo and we traveled around the country and to, but performing um, concerts was very delightful, but I found that I could actually make a living as an artist in residence in schools. So I got to, got, became very familiar with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Artist in Residence program. And I loved doing residencies in schools. I loved working with kids around music and ideas around culture and storytelling. And, uh, and then a part-time position opened up at the Erie Art Museum. <laughs> They were looking for a folklorist um, to start a, a new, to work with a statewide program um, that the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts had that basically gave a little bit of money to different regions of Pennsylvania to have a, uh, to identify traditional artists in the region and to create more access for the community to folk artists and vice, vice versa. And so I started at the museum. And when I started at the museum, I was just amazed by the amazing exhibits that kept changing and what a fascinating place it was. And I said, where's the kids? What, there should be school kids coming through here. We could do so much with this. And uh, although I have uh, very, my art, my visual art background is not um, extensive at all. Um, it, I had exactly what the museum needed <laughs> because they didn't need somebody with an art history degree. They needed somebody who understood school, school culture and how, to, and how to work with teachers and how to make um, exhibits relevant to both teachers of all stripes and students of all ages. So that's where I, I wound up um, kind of creating an education program at the museum alongside the folk art program. And uh, so that's my, sto that's my story. That's in, in a little nutshell. Um, uh, I'm now doing the same folk artwork at Erie Arts and Culture. I left the museum a couple of years ago. But what I want to do is this little exercise. And if, is it still in the chat box? Um, let's see. 
I believe yeah. it is all the way at the top, Kelly. Oh, yeah, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right at the top here. I'll we could copy it again and just post it. Um, so, so what I want you to do is um, hop onto this Google Doc and uh, and and this is this is a little um, exercise that I've done in lots of different situations, and I never get tired of doing it. So basically, we've got this spectrum between traditional cultures and modern cultures. And again, it is a spectrum and um, it isn't a binary thing, but um, and we can all jump in and type into it. So I would say um, if you think about a traditional society, think about societies 100, 200, 500 years ago, um, pretty much 500 years ago, everybody was living in a traditional society pretty much. Um, and, uh, and a modern society would be um, Tokyo, New York, um, the most urban, most connected, most dense um, urban populations are a good, are a good uh, way to sort of define modern. So what defines food in a traditional society? What do people eat? And you can actually type type it in there. Yeah. All right. What they can grow. Yep. Uh, what they can harvest. Right. Yeah. And it, it it helps if you can actually start a new line, and that way you won't. There you go. Aha. What is in season? Mm hmm. Homemade. Absolutely. Yes, not processed, mm -hmm, not manufactured. It is completely natural. Yep, what they can kill, hunting is part of that. We could also add foraging to. Ah, comfort, that's interesting. Aha, so you, yes, of course, traditional dishes are often comfort food, absolutely. Um, and why don't we put, what about modern? Fast food, yes. Takeout. <laughs> it has a long shelf life. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Yes, food is often prepared by somebody else in a modern society. Microwavable, right? Instacart, yes. <laughs> uh huh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. If if you do make it at home, it often means that you're cooking up the the wiener, or you're using the cheese that you bought, or your uh, you already pot, bought the pizza shell, right? Whoa. Wait, shall we hit, shall we hit backspace? I think we, we missed, uh, hold on. We had a whole list of stuff there. Whoop. Oh, well. Not to worry. So, um, so you get, you got the idea. So, um, why don't we think about? So, what are the what? Uh, why don't we take <coughs> this line um, underneath our description and uh, put in? Um, we're going to put the food prep kit here. Why don't you put your name into the? where do you fall on the spectrum? So are you, do you prefer food that is utmost traditional? Then you'd, you put your name under in the one, or, uh, or if you're sort of like traditional, but you also like modern, you might put yourself, um, there we go, yeah.
Uh-huh. We got, oh man, look at all you fence sitters. <laughs> Except Barb, you're a 5.5, so you slightly onto the modern. All right, all right. So what is it? What was, so if you're putting yourself right in the middle, my guess is that it is because you see the good and you see the downside and the benefits of, of both. So what are some of those? Why don't we do this just as actual talking voices for, for this side? What is it, what, what are the advantages of um, traditional, food of the traditional society? So and, much healthier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, much healthier. More nutrition, you know, less less chemicals, and it's just really. Also, the body responds well to what is local, so if it's grown nearby, it's healthy. Mm -hmm. for the I think I put myself into the traditional category just because during COVID you couldn't really go anywhere this year. So my husband planted a wonderful garden, and I found myself really. Um, thinking about seasonal cooking a lot more than I ever have. I'm retired too, which helps. So, so there is that sourdough bread maker. <laughs> and that I think too, for what I was thinking um, for me, there's something that's the memory and the tradition that goes along with it. Like there's certain foods that I always associate with my grandmother, the pierogies and the, you know, so there's, there's a memory that's attached to it too, with the traditional foods. Right. Yes. So there's this connection. There's a connection to your past, to your history, to your family, to the land, to the actual making of it. Um, so what are, what are the downsides of it then? It takes a, a lot of time. <laughs> it takes an enormous amount of time. It takes an enormous amount of time. Kids don't just like it. Uh-huh. We're just also very busy. You know, it's hard to to put the attention on that <clears throat> when we have so many other distractions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think it's one thing that's interesting is you say kids don't like it. Well, um, so how did kids survive in a traditional society? <laughs> I think kids like it when they learn to make it. Yes. Part of it's that, yeah. Is there an option in a traditional society? That's what I was gonna say. There weren't alternatives in a traditional society. You ate it or you went hungry. So right. of course they ate it. But we have so many options now. Yes. And those options have been created to be tantalizing in a way that, yeah, has been engineered, so. But you, you end up liking it more if you've actually grown it yourself and cooked it yourself too. I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, so it's that you're into the convenience. Um, I also suppose that the, one of the major advantages of modern society is the huge array of choice, right? That's kind of amazing that you can get Chinese, Thai, Italian, takeout, pretty much all these different world cuisines are right at our fingertips, which is extraordinary and wonderful. So let's go back to that, um, the document. And why don't we, um, oh yes, good, I see. Yes, there you are, Melissa. You are, you're putting yourself in the traditional can. Um, so the, let's look, why don't we, um, why don't we look at uh, this, um, why don't we look at the others and just have a kind of free for all? We've got schedules and time. We've got living arrangements. We've got uh, um, knowledge and learning and art and music. And why don't you, um, yeah. Why don't you, why don't you start? Yes, there you go. Fill, fill in whatever you want.
I'll share my screen so that Leslie Grace can. Oh, right. Thank you. See. Thank you. Just so, and just as I'll, it's it going to really take over. Entertaining to. I'm figuring can, it out. My iPad was being weird, but I'm in the document. I'm figuring it out. <laughs> okay. Thank you, though. You can, you can minimize. If, if I just took over your screen, you can just um, minimize this. And, and if you just want to look along, we can do it that way too. And that also for the recording, the viewers can see what we're working on. Yeah, that's a good idea. This is really cool to watch it. Ah, uh-huh. Yes, that's interesting. Yes, yes, easy. This is interesting. It's interesting to see how much technology plays in all of these categories mm -hmm. and also media messaging, everything from food to the art and the music is, is influenced by the technology and media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's so um, that, yeah, that there's there, it's also really interesting that 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 one thing that hasn't been said explicitly, but that is completely embedded is how technology mm -hmm. is very much tied to cash, to money, to whereas mm -hmm. like if you don't, if, if you- um, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Uh, that money, money and- Yes, that's mine. Yes, money is really important in terms of success um, for so much uh, for, to, for things like knowledge and learning. Um, although, so, and, and looking at all of this, this is really, really interesting. What is the, what is the, what are, so what are the strengths of the traditional culture in general? What are the strengths of the modern culture? I think one of the strengths of modern modernism is just the change. Um, you know, change I think scares a lot of people, but artists we do tend to dra gravitate towards that—the things that um, stir it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it's it, it is really about change and discovery and growth. 
Um, if you think about how we raise children in a modern society is we try to prepare them for the world that we can't even imagine, right? Uh, to be free thinking, to be independent, to, uh, to, um, to, to do things differently, to invent, to, and that has been uh, a, a strength of the modern, of, of modern society. Uh, and and it's been very important, and that and it and it very much um, is built on the, on growing the individual, right? On how of getting people to stand on their own, to think of themselves, you know, to identify. I mean, our culture is already like that, so in some ways, it's hard to imagine it being any other way, um, unless you unless you've experienced uh, real real community oriented uh, societies, which are not, I mean, it's possible to experience them in even in the United States, even in Northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, but you have to work a little harder to find them. What's the strength of a traditional society? Continuity and, and the connectedness and feeling like you're a part of something. I think that's, you know, what the first thing that pops into my head. Mm -hmm. Right. There's this, you don't have to figure out who you are in a traditional mm -hmm. society. There's a huge, it's a huge burden in a modern society. And you have things like depression <laughs> um, because, and you have identity crises and you don't know who you are. In a traditional society, you are part of a community. This is not, uh, this is not something you have to worry about. Uh, you are in charge of leading those who are younger and you're in charge of following those who are older. Now, of course, the shadow side of a traditional society is that if it's a sexist traditional society and you're a woman, it's not as, uh, you, you, can, you, you have limited, limited options. Um, but you can also say in a modern society, if you're poor, you have incredibly limited, people might say you can do whatever you want to do, be whoever you want to be, but it isn't really true unless you have access, access to power and access to capital. Yeah, smoothies as a meal. This is great, ah, this is, so, um, uh, so, and it is, it's really fun to do this exercise with people who, with uh, former refugees mixed in. I wish we had some with us because they are incredibly articulate about the strengths of traditional cultures, but also their, the, the downsides of traditional cultures. Um, there's, it is, uh, and sometimes I think people get can get kind of tripped up because they think of um, when I say traditional, I don't mean like like sometimes people say, oh, classical music is traditional, and I'm like, actually, it's not really. Um, there are certainly elements of it, but classical music is very much built on modern ideas. It's completely dependent on literacy, musical literacy. It's completely dependent on uh, a, 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 a moneyed hierarchy to support it. Uh, and it's about, you, you're not accepted if you try to write music that sounds like Mozart. People will, will reject you because you're supposed to be writing new music music that has not been heard before. Um, so, but when I think about traditional music as what a lot of people have written down, it is, it is community oriented music. And traditional art is quilting, embroidery, right? Making clothing, it is, it, it both the art and the music is art that has a function. It has a job to do beyond it being an, an aesthetic experience. In modern society, art and music is its own thing. It exists for an aesthetic experience. Um, I was thinking about the technology pieces of it. Now, I grew up in a very small town in Oil City where we had very limited uh, exposure to other cultures, to other people. Um, so one of the benefits that have, oops, I guess I went off, off 
there you are. <laughs> the one thing that I was thinking about is how technology and just the traditional piece really limited my view of the world. And once I started exposing, you know, kind of moving towards the modern, it gave me a, an opportunity to look at the diversity and to look at um, other cultures. Um, when I was growing up, my father said anybody who wasn't Catholic was bad and they were going to hell. And so I grew up very limited in what my experience was, where once you step outside of that, you have a broadening of experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Um, one of uh, one uh, one uh, an African woman who now lives she she came here as a refugee. She's an incredibly wonderful traditional dancer and drummer and singer. And she said, "American culture is about freedom first, uh, and respect comes after that. In African culture, respect comes first. And it's not that we don't believe in freedom, but it isn't as important as respect. Uh, and it's a, it's a different way. It is a different way of thinking. And again, you can be, um, a traditional culture can be limiting, um, but there's also a shadow side of modern culture too, um, where, because we aren't connect, we don't learn to respect and learn to work with each other in, an in, in the kind of intensive way that happens in a more traditional context. So it's really traditional and modern. It's not like one is good and one is bad. They're not at, at all. Um, but understanding both of them is really, really crucial to understanding diversity in your classroom, to understanding, um, uh, to understanding different ways of creating art. Um, it is uh, it, and I think very often with the pursuit of all things mo modern society has a tendency to um, ignore the strengths of the traditional society. Uh, and like, for example, literacy. I mean, there's literate cultures have this assumption that if you don't have literacy, you're just missing this really important skill. Uh, but indeed in a non-literate society, it's not like you don't learn and grow, you just learn different skills than you do with literacy. And literacy, well, that's, wow, that teaches you, it's a, it's a solitary exercise. It's very much about the individual um, and it's very much about abstract, information becomes very abstract. In an oral society, you really learn to watch and to listen and you learn and you learn this deep kind of empathy and you learn also a deep kind of intuition um, that doesn't happen in that literate scientific modern culture uh, and those are those are so important i remember doing um this exercise with a group of uh, special ed teachers. And one of them was looked at the, the traditional side and it's about, you know, and the list they were coming up with saying, well, you know, it's very repetitious. It's really built around relationships. Whereas modern is very, everything's always different. And it's really not about, it's about the next new thing. And she said, boy, everything on the traditional side is everything we're being told as educators is the best way to reach kids uh, who are special needs kids. If we don't have a relationship with them, we can't move forward. If we, we need to figure out ways to do the same thing over and over because that's where they learn best. It's like, she said, wow, there's, it's a different, this is going to be, this is a way better classroom orientation for, uh, for special education, which I thought was kind of astounding. Um, so any other, any other comments? I just, um, Kelly, I did this for the first time with you when you collaborated with my university students and you were an artist in residence with an aesthetic education class I was teaching. And then I did it again tonight. And I was thinking living in this pandemic historical time, it would be interesting to reflect on health and issues of health and community versus individual responsibility. And you mentioned freedom and respect and to think about the ways that we have, how, how our lifestyle has in many ways shifted as Melissa was talking about her relationship to locally grown and homegrown food. And um, 
have some of our traditional orientations to reliance on the community from a health standpoint would be interesting to add to this now. Yes, it would be. We really do. And the idea of, I mean, I don't think we've really thought about public health until most of us haven't really considered it besides from, you know, looking at what restaurants got flagged by the health department, you know, that's pretty much our experience of many of our experiences of what of public health professionals said. Now we think about it in this, like this deep way every day. And it, and do I, you know, wearing a mask and what's safe and how open do you make the schools and all of that? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, also, I mean, it isn't a surprise when you look at people who are most um, vulnerable to COVID are people that are living in close quarters. I mean, again, you've got, uh, you know, in Erie, it's, it's the, it, lots and lots of new Americans have been uh, struck with COVID along with uh, other people who live in these, in poor neighborhoods where you don't have separate bedrooms, you don't have space. It's harder to, it's harder to keep healthy. It's harder to not spread, uh, it's e much easier to spread a virus when you live, when you when not everybody has their own bedroom and bathroom, right? So that's yeah, that's another 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 thing that to consider, yeah. And in one sense, that idea of I think one of the shadow sides of modern society is if you've got money, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, and, but the idea of a responsibility to a broader community doesn't always equate in a, in a modern society because it's about, well, my money is mine. Again, you think about it in a traditional society, where is the wealth? The wealth is in the food, but the food is, is only going to go bad if you hoard it, right? You have to, if you share the food, it makes the whole community healthy. When you start when you start having to pay for food, then, then it's like, well, this is my money, you know? When money is part of that, then it's this sense of, well, this is my money, therefore it doesn't belong to the community, it belongs to me. Um, then, then you get this distance from the greater community, what would make everybody healthier? Um, that, those, are, those are big questions, you know? Those are big, big questions. But I know it's already after eight, so uh, I we don't. It's a Sunday night. I don't want to keep everybody, but I do wanted to show because we have Jen here and Mary Elizabeth and Barb. Um, I just wanted to mention um, this just wonderful thing that made me so happy, even if, if it was during the pandemic, um, was a, 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 a mural. So. We had this very traditional artist. She's a henna artist. Um, and she, uh, she grew up in a village. She doesn't read or write much at all. She never, she was schooled in the traditional, um, she was schooled in the very most traditional way possible in a, in a, in a village in, in Sudan. And uh, she came as a refugee, and uh, and there's there's <laughs> and we had uh, grant funds uh, that we pivoted for COVID to have artists instead of them presenting at uh, Celebrate Erie, the big downtown festival, um, to have them collaborate with one of the markets, ethnic markets in town, to to improve the facade. So. And there's Nawak, and there's some of her henna art on her. That she's noticed she's even got the scarification um, on her forehead. That that's that's part of what uh, um, a Shuluk woman. This is the ethnic group she's part of. This means you've come of age when you have this these um, marks on your forehead. Um, and henna is all is a community celebration among women to mark rites of passage, in particular weddings but also it marks a woman who is married. Um, and it's an adornment. It's, they use the, the henna grows right there. They make it into a powder and then they make it into a paste. Um, although Nawak prefers to use hair dye now that she's in Erie, it's a lot easier and faster and more accessible. 
Um, really? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and it shows up on her, on her dark skin better too. So she's, she's teaching henna to her, to her daughters as well. Um, so these are some of the work that her, she and her daughters have done. Uh, it's really pretty, pretty stunning. And it's very bold. If, if you're familiar with henna, it's different than the henna that comes from South Asia, which is way more delicate um, and intricate where it's very African. Hers is, and she's very much like Sudanese henna. It's bold. It's, it's very, it's very strong lines. So she uh, decided to work with this market right at the corner of Brown and Cherry. It's owned by a Sudanese man, and uh, and thanks to the help uh, the help of uh, Jen Peters and other art teachers in Erie, they helped walk her through the whole process. So we we, we took the um, panels that go around the door and sized them down. Um, to something that's basically arm's length, which is what she's used to working. That's the scale she's used to. And she came up with some bunch of different ideas and uh, she chose um, a couple of different designs from these mock-ups that she did with Henna. Uh, and then um, there's, there's uh, Kathy, Kathy, yes. Uh, helping Kathy her Kathy Johnson. Out. Yes, Kathy, Kathy Johnson. Johnson, thank you. Kathy Johnson. Um, we projected them onto the poly tab, thanks to the 19th Amendment mural women helped her along here. And then uh, she painted it in, and this is completely new. She'd never painted anything before in her life. Um, and, and there it is, the finished, the finished project, product. Um, it's beautiful. It is absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and thanks to, to Jen Peters was the lead uh, on this. She did an amazing job working with, working with Nawak. Um, and there's Nawak at the opening. She did the henna to match the public art for the opening. And I don't know, Barb or, or Mary Elizabeth or Jen, like what, what do you want to talk a little bit about that experience of working with Nawak? Um, just amazing in terms of, well, we painted on her porch uh, a lot of the times outside. It was uh, September, October, I think. Well, September. And um, her gardens were out there. She grows, they grow all their own food. I mean, um, it was really kind of a beautiful experience. Uh, her grandkids were there. Her daughter was there. Some would come and go. We saw her husband and um, it just uh, was amazing. And she, she needed a little push because she felt a little nervous about working with acrylic paint. And then like, boom, she got it. And um, just kind of uh, amazing to watch her kind of take this in and realize that this was her project. And I, it was really great. I don't know. Really, but Kelly, it was awesome. Thanks so much. Oh, it was, it was wonderful to have all of your, I could not have had her do, I didn't know how, I don't know how to do a mural. Um, that was, I think it was, it was art education at its best. What I saw there was um, because I didn't have to worry about any of you um, taking over. You, you're all educators and you really, you supported her. You helped kind of move her along, um, but you, you had, it was her vision and her ideas. Um, she's now painting everything in her house. <laughs> She'll send me these pictures of the lampshades are painted. Her baby, the baby, the grandchild, the baby grandchild's crib is now painted. Now there's this other to So she's she's now just doing it to everything in her, inside her home, which is which is pretty wonderful. And for her, it was I think just an astounding experience of support from women. I think that was another thing. I don't think she would have um, felt comfortable if it was a man working with her, it wouldn't have been socially acceptable actually um, to show up at her house or a man to show up her house day after day. So uh, it was, it, it, it was a, a beautiful, a beautiful experience. Uh, 
And it was wonderful to see the reactions of the people that, that go to the shop and the market and to see it and to notice it and, and, uh, and, and to love it, so. All right, so I, I know again, it's now 8.14, we, we thought it would last an hour and I went over. So, oh, but that's okay, you. Kelly. Yeah, yeah. This was um, wonderful to see all of you, and thanks for coming and hanging out. And wasn't quite a breakfast uh, talk, but but it was good to see everybody. You would have absolutely. Never Let's see what happens when we all unmute and clap really loud for Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> resounding applause thank yeah. you so much kelly it's always good to be with you and hear your stories yes well thanks thanks yes i, I yeah and i don't think we um we solved anything but hopefully we got better questions out of this so right uh, kelly's our go-to for our, all sorts of amazing connections in erie i mean truly so thanks uh, for sure fun. We are so lucky to have you <laughs> just in our lives individually, but also I, I know all of us talk when we get together about what a what a treasure you are. So oh, well, thank you. Thank but, you. Uh, yes, it's it is the Erie has amazing diversity and it's uh, and that the more people are uh, get to know it and are less afraid of it, the I the healthier our community and more vibrant and happier community will be so definitely well thank you so much kelly and um before we let everyone go just a few housekeeping items um we hope you enjoyed this evening's presentation please find the link in the chat for our next paea webinar feminist pedagogy and 3d printing in the middle school which is scheduled for sunday january 25th at 7 p.m the link to register is also available on the PAEA website under the Professional Development tab, as well as the PAEA Facebook and Instagram pages. And, uh, excuse me, and also uh, from forthcoming emails for your region and division reps. Please also make sure that you have signed into the chat to verify your attendance. Uh, and again, we thank Kelly uh, and all of you for joining us this evening. Can I just Night, say everyone. one thing? Sure. Jess is going to be co-leading a book club um, with Dr. Lisa Kay in March and April with uh, Dr. Lisa Kay's new book on Dover book on art therapy. So you should you should promote that a little bit. <laughs> I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> I've been reading, been reading it, but yeah, I had my mind on this tonight. So thanks, Melissa. Sure. Well, we hope that some of you will join that book club. So it'll be great. Kelly, are you up for um, hanging around? If anyone has more questions, absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, I'm going to stop our recording, but um, folks, feel free to hang out for a few. <laughs>